Uh, it seems to me that the history of competency-based training is actually really important to have some understanding in order that you can put the current competency-based training system into some sort of context. What I'd like to do in the first place is take you back to about 1987. Now, competency-based training did start in one form or another a long time before 1987. We've talked quite a bit about the popularisation of behaviourist learning theory, really as a result largely of the Second World War and the need to really upskill a lot of people really quickly. But in sort of mid-1980s period, there was a push to a much more strong focus on competency-based training in vocational education. For some people in the faith, the notion of competency-based training was a new idea, and for some people it wasn't at all. They had been using behaviourist curriculum for years and years, and so it just simply wasn't you know, a big change for them. But for some others, it was. And, and this first video gives a bit of a sense of the sorts of arguments that were being posed in about 1988-ish um, for uh, competency-based training. Australia had uh, ridden on the sheep's back, survived very much on the export of wool and, uh, and basically exporting raw product. And it was coming back into the country as refined product, as manufactured product, and that was where the real money was. Now, what happened at that time was that uh, the Hawke government came into power and uh, the Labor government came into power and it was, it was a very much a time when there was a high level of agreement amongst unions, employers and government about the state of the economy. Now, at that time, interest rates on house loans were 17.5%. Unemployment was absolutely massive. Things were really tough. And... Uh, Essentially it was argued that Australia was still sort of the world's mine really. People were mining stuff out of it, taking it, and taking it away and bringing it back in a, in a manufactured form and that Australia needed to get a bit smarter about this. They needed to skill up. There was a delegation that was associated with uh, ACTU, there's some uh, government people and um, senior employee, employer body people that went to Europe to see what they were doing in Europe because there was a perception that Europe and Japan were doing much better in this economic environment than um, Australia was. And really what they came back with was saying we need to implement competency-based training and that it's in everyone's interests to do this. It's in the employer's interest because it's the way you get skilled labour. It's in the union's interest because it's the way you get people into jobs. And it's in the government's interest because if you have a skilled nation you will get a better economy. The notion of award restructuring was really about bringing the structure of industry into modern times. The metals industry, um, employers and the union and the government got together and they said, look, we've got to rationalise. And they cut the number of categories in the in metals industry award, civilly cut it. And so this notion of being multi-skilled, that people should be able to do more than one small job in, uh, in a manufacturing industry. And that in order to support that change, what needed to be in place was an education system that would support that. So what happened at the time was there was this um, coming together because of, the, um, because of the concerns of government employers and the union, there was a coming together really of three policy areas. And it's difficult, uh, and it's sort of it's not sensible to look at the training agenda, competency-based training, in isolation from the other policy agendas that were running at the time. In particular, the policy agendas of workplace reform and industrial relations reform. And I've talked about those a little bit already. The driving force behind the changes in the vocational education sector, the growth and mass in the vocational ed education sector, was not driven by an educational concern primarily. It was primarily driven by an economic concern. And the economic concern was about creating, was primarily about um, developing Australia as an internationally competitive country. The notion of globalisation was being talked about, can't be isolationist and also We've just talked, we've talked briefly about the industrial relations reform, that there were these changes going on in the awards, rationalisations of awards, and uh, there was a lot of workplace reform going on. Some of you will remember, for example, um, the massive changes that occurred in the newspaper printing industry at the time. 
and, and large industrial concerns because essentially the, the whole mechanism through which um, papers were being produced was simply being changed from, an old, from the old industrial model towards a more computerised model. Um, and that was going on everywhere which meant that people not only needed to rationalise, there was not only a need to rationalise um, the, the, the skills that people had, but there were new skills that people needed all, all of a sudden. And also, um, because, because business was driving for um, efficiency, there was a need for people to be multi-skilled. You know, that it's not all right that you just do this job. You have to be able to do this job, this job and this job. You have to be not, not a generalist, but you have to be able to do more than one thing. So a simple example would be um, in the case, for example, of a hot water service. If your hot water service um, was to break, you'd have to, get, uh, you'd have to get an electrician in to disconnect, you'd have to get a plumber in to do the, do the gas and the water, and then you'd have to get an electrician in to reconnect. Now that was going on in industries all over the place, and if you can't, and in industry, of course, if you can't coordinate all of that, it means that you've got you've got downtime in large amounts. So some of the changes that have occurred in the regulations and the training and the availability of, uh, and so on have have tried to address some of those what people saw as really inefficiencies. So you need to look at the whole training reform agenda, and it was called at that point the National Training Reform Agenda, uh, of which competency-based training was a central, central factor. You have to look at it in relation to those other policy agendas. Now, and this is where competency-based training, as we know it today, emerged. 